Thank you very much. Thank, so thanks for the philosopher as well for inviting me to, to be in, in conversation with Lars around his new book. Um, and some of what my introduction uh, has already been said, but I'm just going to repeat a few things. So my ve is, is, is the, and here we go, if you haven't seen it, here is a, a copy here. Uh, my ve is the, the third book in Lars's second trilogy. The first trilogy, as we've seen, is, is Spurious, Dogma, and Exodus. And I have them all here as well, so you can see them and to get an idea. Now, in these, this early trilogy, the conversation or kind of the, the, the novel centers around two philosophy academics. But in the second trilogy, Wittgenstein Jr., Nietzsche and the Burbs, and My Ve, well, this looked at academic experience from the other side of the uh, uh, of, of academia, which is to say the side of the student. Um, in Wittgenstein uh, Jr., Wittgenstein Jr. is a philosophy lecturer at Cambridge uh, who resembles Wittgenstein. In Nietzsche and the Burbs, <clears throat> Nietzsche is a former private school pupil who transfers to a public school uh, and, and, and hence the, the, the novel's title. And in My Ve, we follow a series of PhD students uh, enrolled uh, on a course or a PhD rather in the Center for Dis Disaster Studies at All Saints University and the newest arrival among these PhD students at All Saints University is a new student called Simone Vey named after obviously the 20th century philosopher of the same name so we have the students this time rather than the academics and Simone Vey is the newest recruit for the Center of Disaster Studies at um, All Saints University and I nearly tripped over my words there because for those of you who don't know <clears throat> uh, Lars completed his PhD in philosophy in a philosophy department at Manchester Metropolitan University where I'm now a lecturer in philosophy and what you might also find interesting is Manchester has two universities right next door to each other so even though this is a work of fiction and of course we should always read it as a work of fiction uh, it has a special place for those people who know Manchester, who know philosophy in Manchester, and you might be able to kind of uh, imagine some of the, the places and conversations that, that are going on in this novel. Um, so I'm very grateful, particularly in being asked to, to do this because of my own relationship to Manchester, uh, my own lecturing in a, in a philosophy department here. Um, and so what I want to do firstly is introduce Lars, who will do a uh, give sort of a 10, 15 minute, 10 minute, whatever, uh, reading from the novel. So you get a sense of, of what it's about, how it reads, if you haven't already already read it. Uh, and then we're going to open up and I'm going to ask Lars a few questions, which is going to draw on his experience of writing the novel and the relationship between philosophy and literature that he's that he's interested in, uh, as well as as well as the place of Simone Weil in the novel as well. So, uh, Lars, over to you if you'd like to do your reading. Thank you, Tiff, for your introduction. Thank you, everyone, for coming out tonight. And thanks to the, um, the philosopher for hosting this. Very much appreciated. My characters in this section uh, have just attended a party. My characters are from a university called All Saints. All Saints students see themselves as the poor relations of Victoria University. So my characters have just gone to a party at Victoria University. After. Walking to the bus stop. Fuck, Marty says. Fuck. We were played, Valentine says. We were duped. I think they liked you, Gita says. I think you did your bit for All Saints slash Victoria PhD student relations. Sure, they thought we were colourful, Marty says. As though they were at a zoo or something. They're like the royals on tour, Valentine says. They take it all in their stride, like nothing human is strange to them. I hate the way we were given the spotlight in turn, Ismail says. Permitted our little idiosyncrasies, our little turns. It's containment. I mean, they even had you cowed, Marcy. They made me feel like a fucking imposter, Marcy says. See, if we were really lumpen, we would have started a fight, I say. Which we'd lose, Marty says. Those posh boys learn boxing at school. Yeah, but we'd fight dirty, Valentine says. We'd bite and stuff. We'd foam at the mouth like rabid dogs. If we were truly lumpen, 
We wouldn't have gone in the first place, Marty says. Just robbed the place and burnt it down to destroy the evidence. They weren't actually rude, Gita says. They were disdainful, I say. They were all but tittering at us. I actually thought they were being nice, Gita says. I don't see why you guys have to be so hysterical. It's what they do to us, Marty says. It's what class war looks like. It's microaggression after aggression. It's micro-assault and battery. Why do you have to be so sensitive, Gita asks. My God, don't they know how much we hate them, Marty says. Or even that we hate them, Valentine says. There's so much ferocity in us, we agree. They should have felt afraid like the Romanovs before Rasputin. Rasputin. They should have known terrible deeds were afoot. That there was wild, divine violence on the horizon. They should have felt some augury of the end of their murder. They should have known that we were their grave diggers, spiritually, if not actually. Grave diggers, Valentine says. We actually deferred to them. I didn't, Marty says. You were bowing and scraping like the rest of us, Valentine says. Typical working-class fascination with aristos and pseudo-aristos. We were gauche in a thousand ways, we agree. We embarrassed ourselves. We made things worse. Why did we have to tell them about Vortex terrorist plans? About Valentine's human sacrifice plans? About Denmom's faith in lump and non-plans? About our futile resistance to the man? And then there was Gnosticism. Why did we have to bring up Gnosticism? When prophecy fails, apocalypticism arises. That's what we told them. And when apocalypticism fails, Gnosticism comes to stand at the door. We spoke of our ur disgust, of our all disgust, and they looked at us nonplussed. We told them about our divine self-hatred about God as sacrilege, about positing God only to murder him anew. And they looked at us nonplussed. We told them that God exists only in his death, his expulsion, his violation. And they looked at us nonplussed. We spoke of the death of man, of decreation and destitution. And they looked at us nonplussed. We spoke of the necessity of forgetting of thoughts out of use, of philosophy left idle. And they looked at us nonplussed. We told them of our desire to write of the illimitable as the illimitable, to know dissolution as dissolution. And they looked at us nonplussed. We told them how we wanted to unwrite with our writing, to unstudy with our studies. And they looked at us nonplussed. We told them we wanted to seize upon study itself, to write of the time of study, the time of listening. We told them that the time of study must also be the study of time. And they looked at us nonplussed. And we began to feel nonplussed ourselves. We began to doubt ourselves, second-guess ourselves, judge ourselves, think ourselves wrong. They made us hate ourselves when we should be hating them. And the way they sipped their drinks. They're not guzzlers like us. They weren't looking to drown themselves in alcohol like we were. It wasn't emergency drinking for them, desperation drinking. They didn't drink because they needed the antidote and fast. They weren't apocalyptic drinkers like we are. They weren't eschatological drinkers. They didn't drink because they were thirsty for the end and the name, the end never came. They weren't waiting for the drunken Kairos, for the drunken moment, for the moment they'd missed because of their drunkenness. They didn't decide to meet us in alcoholism, which would be true hospitality. They didn't try to reach out to us through inebriation to heal the All Saints Victoria divide through deliberate hangover manufacture, by following pickleback logic with us to the end of the night. 
revenge on the Victoria PhD students. That's what, that's what we need. Victory to reset the agenda, to move the debate onto another plane. Marcy will have to take up badminton again, quite clearly. He'll have to re-enter the fray, win the Manchester Postgraduate Badminton Tournament. There's the honour of all saints to think of. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Lars. Uh, I've, I've heard, I've got to confess, I've heard Lars do a reading of this before, and I always think it's important to, to hear how he conceives of, of what it should sound like and the rhythm and the kind of the timber of everything. So I think that's an important precursor to maybe some of the questions and some of the comparisons I'm going to make with some of Vey's work later on. And there's a few claps in the chat. So there you go, Lars. That's, um, people are enjoying it. Very good. <laughs> Brilliant. So, so my first question then is, is going to basically kind of almost unpack where it began. Uh, and I think it'll be in interesting to the audience here. Um, so in the novel, we're, we're students. Uh, in the previous trilogy, we're academics. But where did you first come across Simone Weil? Did you find her as a student or as an academic? And, and further to this, what was that initial experience of reading Bay like for you? Because she's such an idiosyncratic writer. She has such an effect usually on people, on the body of people almost when they first read her, almost to the detriment of her ideas. People get carried up and carried away in reading her and less sometimes about thinking about her ideas. So yeah, where did you come across her and what was your first experience of her? I was neither a student nor an academic. I was living in my hometown. I come from a town called Wokingham. It's in the southeast of England. It's a very wealthy part of the world. Uh, it's a part of the world which is um, full of uh, big IT companies and other companies. So there's lots of work there. When I was 23, I was living back in my hometown. And I didn't know what to do with my life. I had the vague idea that I wanted to study further, perhaps do a postgraduate um, degree, perhaps a PhD. But I couldn't really work out how you got funding for these things. And I wasn't really sure what I wanted to study anyway. And I was fortunate in the suburbs, which were otherwise culturally uh, pretty derelict. There wasn't, there wasn't much there in terms of philosophy. I was fortunate in having a family friend who had a small collection of books, which he read when he was young, back in the 50s and 60s. And one of those books was Simone Weil's Waiting for God, which was an important introduction to Simone's, uh, Simone Weil's work for me. And reading it an old paperback copy, I got a sense of the importance of these ideas of affliction, of attention. I made an appointment with, with myself. I said, one day, I'm going to come back to the work of Simone Weil and study it properly with the attention that it deserves. This was deferred for many, many years. I don't know how many years, 25 years or more. But I always feel very grateful for coming across the ideas of Simone Weil back then in the suburbs, back then in the suburbs of London, back there in a place where there wasn't much culture. You know, in those times, ideas, you were very grateful for them. And back then, you know, in my bedroom, back in 1993, I was trying to assemble myself, put myself together, much like a, much like a dresser crab. A dresser crab dresses its shell, makes its shell out of things it finds on, on the, on the seafloor. And likewise, I was trying to make myself into something from picking up scraps of writing here and there. And some of the things I got from Simone Weil were exactly those ideas of affliction, of attention. So I tried to incorporate those into my thought world. And later on, I went on to study um, thinkers who were influenced by Simone Weil. I was able to feel a way into those thinkers. So Simone, Simone Weil stands right at the beginning of my intellectual uh, biography. Mm, that's brilliant. Thanks so much. I mean, I think, I think that's uh, that's an experience that that some other people share in terms of, you know, finding finding Bay, not quite knowing what to do with her at that particular time, uh, sitting on her as it were, letting her ideas gestate in the background, and then at some point when the time becomes right, as it were, they they seem to they seem to be called forth, and I think they would almost like that idea of kind of waiting and divination and being called to something rather than them going towards it. I had a similar experience in terms of not quite the same sort of long durée as it were, but you know, reading Vey in my masters and then not forgetting about her, but then letting her kind of sit for a while all through the PhD and into the beginning of my academic career and then taking her up again in the last few years. There's something about uh, allowing that first experience to sit and then having the time to kind of come back round. 
uh, to her as well. And I can't I can't imagine the experience of of, of reading this this philosopher in, in in the suburbs, as it were. I think there's also something truly interesting in that as well. Um, that's great. The second question, and this is something which which has come from my own reading of the novel, and what I think to be uh, is to be a, a central theme in the novel. And it's it's a kind of two pronged question. And if you'll if you'll forgive me, it's a little bit of a longer question with a few quotations in it to give the audience a bit of an idea of some of the things that that I want to bring out and, and that Vey is in talk, talking about. Um, and this is because the question of method is really prescient in the novel. And Vey herself often talks about method. Um, and in particular, the novel returns time and again to the struggle that someone might have, a PhD student in this case, of finding a method, the struggle of finding a way to think. And this is uh, given satirical force by the 9 a.m. methods class that the protagonists are all forced to attend. And I wonder if that was drawn from your own experience, but maybe you can answer that in a second. So for the people who don't know, the 9 a.m. methods class is what all the PhD students are forced to attend. And it's portrayed as sort of the arch bogeyman, the killer of philosophy, the killer of thought in some ways. Um, the, the, the purview of business studies students, but not the philosopher. And they thinks about method a lot in her work. And famously, she used, utilizes contradiction as a kind of method for thinking through ideas. And if you'll permit me, I'll quote a few uh, a few things from Vey now, which, you, which you, you'll no doubt have come across, but just to give the audience an idea. So Vey writes, quote, we have to elucidate the way contradictories have of being true. Method of investigation. As soon as we have thought of something, try and see in what way the contrary is true, end quote. Quote again, contradictions are the only realities. They are the criterion of the real. And finally, she says, quote, all true good carries with it contradictions which are contradictory and as a consequence is impossible. He who keeps his attention really fixed on this impossibility and acts will do what is good, end quote. So the question of method, the question of contradiction is central to Ve, and you clearly share a, a real interest in uh, in the question of method. And I think that's manifested in the idea of the novel as method. And this is not to say that Maive is making a long form argument as a kind of philosophical novel, but it is utilizing the literary and satire in order to reveal some kind of kernel of truth about a particular kind of experience, the experience of being an All Saints PhD student. Um, and they herself often turn to the literary in order to communicate certain philosophical ideas. For, for, for people out there who don't know, they wrote a play called Venice Saved, which has recently been translated into English. And more recently, she was uh, she wrote a, a collection of, or she wrote many poems that have recently been collected and translated into English as the mirror of obedience. So they was really interested in the literary as method. So my question to you is, after that long introduction, were you always writing literature, even during your PhD? And did it help with your kind of theoretical and philosophical development? Um, and second, is there some sort of special relationship for you, or do you think in general, between the literary and philosophical that makes you return time and again to the kind of the novel as method for fleshing out some ideas, in, whether in Wittgenstein, Nietzsche, or Ve? Thank you very much for a really considered and very rich question. Lots of things to take up there. Um, the question of method, it comes etymologically, the word method, from the Greek meaning path. It's the path you follow. So the method is, is the how, how you, how you get somewhere, how you get to um, something or other, how you get to your thought. Uh, so what's, what's the path that you follow? My PhD students are subjected to um, PhD student methodology classes where they're taught a method that will enable them to proceed with their study. Now, I was never sub subjected to these things at all. I'm, I'm very lucky. But my students, the students I've taught, uh, have been subjected to these, to these methodology classes, which are not particularly useful because they're very generic and they're very broad based. And they have at their heart a model of, of relationship to a PhD, which isn't the one we normally understand as being important in the humanities. It's a model which privileges results, uh, means ends, um, time management, 
it's a result which seems to banish the idea of contemplation. And the notion of contemplation is very important to Simone Weil, especially when it comes to the notion of the contradiction. So in Simone Weil's thought, contradiction is very important. The idea for Simone Weil is we try to overcome various dualisms in thought. One of those dualisms is between the idea of necessity and the idea of the good. So for Simone Weil, our universe, the universe in which we live, this world, this cosmos, is something which obeys um, laws and it has a sense, there's a sense of proportion, there's a sense of, of balance. At the same time, um, our universe can seem cruel because as a result of those, those same laws, terrible things occur. There's terrible things that happen, suffering all over the world. So we might think, okay, there's a, there's a contradiction here between necessity, the way in which the world has to be because of these laws, and, well, the things that happen within the world, these horrors, these terrors, this suffering. We might think, if we are religious believers, there's a con contradiction between necessity and the good and God. How, if God is good, how could God allow the universe to exist in the way that it does? For Simone Weil, the point is not to simply try and solve these contradictions very quickly, but to contemplate them, to muse upon them, to think about them, to work out the relationship between the apparent contraries. And the idea for Simone Weil is, through an act of grace, through an act of, um, of divine grace, you can see how these contraries are not contraries at all. In fact, there's a higher harmony, a higher harmony in which things are reconciled, in which goodness and necessity are actually one when viewed from a certain perspective. And that's what Simone Weil tries to encourage us to do. That's what she thinks of as a method of philosophy, is contemplating contradictions and through those contradictions, resolving them and understanding a unity, a unity which links together the natural and the supernatural, um, a... a, a um, um, a unity which is given to us through an um, experience of divine grace. So that's the idea for Simone Weil with her method of um, philosophy, which occurs by um, through awaiting and then opening oneself to the possibility of grace. OK, so the novel itself is a medium. I was always writing fiction, um, literary things from a young age and especially during my um, university study and PhD, always, always writing something or other. I could never get anything to work. I think one of the problems with my, my literary endeavours in those days was the absence of this contradiction. So in some sense, what you have to hold together in a work of fiction, I think, is um, the prose of the world, the comedy of the world, the bathos of the way in which we live in the world, get buses into work, um, wait around at the bus stop, get drunk with our friends, have a laugh. The contradiction between that and a sense of higher meaning, of higher purpose of finding something to live for. It can seem there's a contrast between these two things. The, the one, or getting our bus and living on a day-to-day -day basis, seems very low and ordinary and rather boring. The other seems very lofty. Now, when I was younger, I always wanted to write the lofty. I always wanted to write about lofty things. As I grew older, I learned that the key to writing fiction for me was in writing about the lofty through the mundane and through the ordinary of allowing um, this world, the world in which we, we live, to be right at the centre of the novel. You can't talk about these larger things, in my view, directly in a work of fiction. What you can do is to proceed indirectly. And in many ways, that resonates with something of what Simone Weil is doing, because Simone Weil's mode of communication, um, the mode of philosophy is to understand the world as something you can read. You read it as a sign, a sign which points elsewhere. And likewise, in my account of the ordinary lives of my protagonists, there's a, um, a way of understanding this as a series of signs that point elsewhere, that open up a contradiction, that open up a contradiction between their lives and their pathetic immediacy and something which lies beyond those lives. So in that, to that extent, novel writing, fiction writing, is also about a kind of contem uh, a contemplation an opening of a space in which we can ponder that relationship between the low and the high. Mm, absolutely, and I, I, I mean, and for Ve, it's it's clearly shared. Uh, Venice saved uh, the poems. They all take these themes: the making of the low into the high, and the high into the low, uh, and kind of confusing them and showing us how we can find one and the other, uh, and in places where we don't necessarily think. 
the the the, the explanation you gave on contradiction is brilliant, and I love one of the things that Bayes says is that the operations of reason, the operations of kind of a utilitarian form of reason, make the contradictories that we come up against transparent to the mind. And as soon as reason figures something out, that's it, it becomes transparent and you see through it. But they doesn't necessarily want us to see through it. You know, the, tra the problem of dreadful suffering and a divine good is not something to be solved and looked through, but something to be contemplated, like you say, to be confronted with and to be attended to. And this idea of attention, uh, this is going to lead me into my next question, is exactly, as you know, a key Valian uh, concept. And as a, a Vey person reading the novel, I couldn't help but notice her concepts and ideas weaving throughout the text. Um, sometimes this would be implicit in the text, and I suppose you'd only really know that they were there if you had read a bit of Vey. Sometimes they would be explicit. Um, so for among, amongst other ideas, I discerned and you quite explicitly spoke about ideas such as atheism as a form of purification, the impersonal, the self, decreation, affliction, and so on and so forth. And sometimes, or even more, even more explicitly, explicitly in the novel, there are certain lines that are almost directly lifted from Ve, such as when a character asks, for instance, of a homeless person, quote, I wonder if he, if he ever expected the good at one point. And this, as you know, but for the people in the audience who may not, is a direct reference to uh, a belief that Ve holds, that all beings go on indomitably expecting that good and not evil will be done to them. This is like a basic expectation that lives at the heart of every human being. The good will be done to us. That's what we go on thinking, unless we're perhaps in deep affliction. Now, my question is, <clears throat> when you choose to include these ideas in the novel, or I, supp I suppose when you choose, when you use or choose any philosophical idea in a novel, is there a certain freedom in using them in a literary context insofar as you don't need to justify them, you don't need to argue for or against them, you don't need to present them as your position, you only need to kind of present them as such. And in this, um, one of the draws, I mean, is this for you one of the draws of using the kind of literary form? Because whilst Bay's ideas are deeply alluring, we might want to play with them, we might want to think about them, we're quite hesitant sometimes in endorsing them, but the novel seems to allow you to kind of put them forward, allow people to think about them and attend them without you necessarily endorsing anything she's saying. Is that, is that the kind of freedom that literature gives you as a philosopher? Thank you again, that's a wonderful question. Look, yes, you get freedom as, as, a, as a literary writer, a certain freedom, but that freedom is hard won. One of the difficulties of writing these last three novels and it's difficulty which I embraced, and I wanted this difficulty, one of the difficulties of writing them is trying to set these these thinkers, these these these, these inclinations of these thinkers, uh, Wittgenstein, Nietzsche, and Simone Weil, in contemporary Britain. The amount of work you have to do in order to be able to allow these novels to play with these thinkers' ideas is enormous, because what you have to try and do is create characters who are plausible, who are engaging for the readers, and then you have to create a version of, in this case, Simone Weil who finds herself amidst these characters. You have to make her a plausible character, make her someone who can embody Simone Weil in some sense. The difficulty here is the real Simone Weil is so remote from contemporary British life. I mean, so, so remote from a very secular country, from a country which doesn't have an enormous interest in European-style philosophy, for a country which, um, in which philosophy is not vastly important and these sorts of ideas are not really current so that the huge question when you're writing literary fiction set in the present um concerning philosophical ideas is how can you embed these ideas in your work in some way or another and how can you do it it's almost impossible because you know um these thinkers are so far are so so removed from our times so the question is how do you bring them into your fiction without trying to simply make them in, in some crass sense relevant What's important here is to hang on to the um, the untimeliness of these thinkers, the fact that they don't fit, the fact that, that they, they, they come from elsewhere, but to do so in a way that has effects on the characters around them. So what happens when my um, versions of Wittgenstein, Nietzsche and Simone Weil appear in our contemporary Britain is there they are, and that they're sharing their ideas, which are recognizably ideas from Simone Weil and, and elsewhere. Um, it's the effects that those ideas have on the people around them that's important. 
how do my other characters who are comic characters who fool around who lark about who are characters like many of us how are those characters affected by these ideas how are they caught up with them how can they put them into play and there's another contradiction here between the character simone Vey and these and these characters there's another difference between the high and the low Simone Weil in the novel is a lofty person, a person who seems very distant from my characters, a person to whom they look up. In particular, my narrator and central protagonist, Johnny. And Johnny falls in love with Simone Weil. And, some, and, and Johnny even propositions Simone Weil. And in that scene, which is the heart of the novel, it's the scene in the novel which I find the most um, tolerable, which I'm not totally horrified by. In that scene, we find that contradiction. There is Johnny. There is Johnny looking for, what's he looking for? Full of longing, full of despair. And he brings this despair up to its highest pitch in that particular scene because he's, he makes a romantic advance on Simone Weil and he's rejected. And he feels that rejection. And the world seems even more horrifying and difficult to him at that very moment. Simone Weil says somewhere, you have to push the contradiction to its maximum extent. And in that scene, we see we see my character Johnny feeling base and low and humiliated. And we see Simone yet more, more glorious, more ascetic, more devoted to the good. And that, that contradiction comes to an absolute maximum. And that's the kind of thing that literary, literary writing allows. But, you know, it's a really difficult path to get to that scene. That scene, I, I wrote most of it on the very last day before I had to get the novel into the publisher. That last scene. So it, it came, you know, only under enormous pressure could I, could, I, could, I, could I write that scene. So the literary path, the literary method is a difficult one. Yeah, absolutely. And, and shared by all the accounts that we have of Vey's own experience of writing Venice Saved, for instance, which we have in note form and we can see from her notebooks that it's that it's a fractured and difficult birth along a long period of time of which, of course, she doesn't get to finish because she dies before it's finished. So we only have the note version. So, again, we, we see the, the pain and the difficulty of of giving birth to that. Now, we don't have long, very long left, but I want to I want to maybe end on something which is perhaps a bit of a stretch, but I really like it in terms of Vey's idea. And it's something that I can see in the novel of work as well. And it's to do with the madness that is the world of a PhD student. Because in her essay, Are We Struggling for Justice? Simone Weil argues that only a kind of madness, a madness of love, can adequately confront the horrors of our time. The horrors of our time are quite often, she thinks, the result of a sort of rational, utilitarian kind of thought. And in the face of this utilitarian kind of reasoning, only the, those who are mad can be just. For justice, she says, demands that we do not do necessarily what's in our best interests, whereby best interests is sort of like the accumulation of power, money or something, but is to look past our best interests to the needs of the other. The madness of the PhD is also often pitted against an outside world that's sort of rational, utilitarian, it sort of makes sense. And the lives of the PhD student seeks to kind of problematize this making sense of the, of the world. And I got a real sense of this feverish madness of the PhD student pitted against a world that seems all too rational to the point that it becomes mad. Um, and I wondered if you could, could speak about the kind of feverishness of the madness that you imbue into the, into the experience of the PhD and if that is some, some form, of, form of social commentary as well. Yes, yeah, certainly. And this is, again, a fascinating question. So the madness of the PhD student. Um, the PhD students in the novel are studying for studying's sake. They don't expect to get jobs in academia. The mm -hmm. university at which they're studying is not, a, is not ranked highly on the league tables. <laughs> and even though they're, they're studying very seriously, they think they have no chance whatsoever. And they, they worry that they they'll be expelled back out there. They always use this phrase, out there, back into the world, back into the horror of the world. My characters are all dualists. They're Gnostics. They're named after um, the Gnostic uh, philosophers and thinkers who flourished around the same sort of time as Jesus, 200 years before, 200 years after that sort of period. The Gnostics were dualists because they thought this world was terrible. They thought this world was appalling. They thought this world was evil. And unlike Simone Weil, they didn't think the contradiction between our terrible world and what for them was the true God and reality could be overcome. 
the Gnostics remain this terrible dualism, as do my characters, for the most part, until the very end. So the characters in my novel are Gnostics, which means they, they despise the world around them, and they, they, they're looking for something with great longing. They're looking for a, a gnosis. They're looking for some knowledge, looking for some relation, something transcendent beyond the world that would justify the existence of the world and justify the existence of their lives. But that contradiction is very hard for them to overcome. And that's the tragedy of the novel for many of the characters, is how can you overcome this difference between, again, the low and the high? How can they overcome who it is they are? So that's the difficulty, and that's the, the, the main enigma of the novel. So madness. Madness can take the form in Simone Weil of a compassion, a compassion for others, the suffering others, compassion for them which is direct and immediate and not about any gain for you, not about your project, not about what you want. You feel implicated, personally called. You feel a vocation when you confront the other who is afflicted. And that vocation is a calling for Simone Weil to the high, to something beyond this world. So my characters do have these moments where they feel called. Johnny, the protagonist, he feels this. So they have a sense of what, what, what might point them beyond this world, but only a sense. So there's that madness. But there's also this, 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 the madness of, of thinking about the out, out there and where they're going to return and what they're going to do and to worry about a world which, um, which you know, and, uh, this, is, this, is, this would be my view, a world which is understood technologically, which is a great tragedy of our time, which everything is a result of means, ends, relations, in which everything is about pragmatism, it's about results, it's never about immediate cause, never about vocation. So that's exactly right, um, Tiff. It's all about it is, it is a matter of social critique for me. Mm, brilliant. Thank you so much for, for drawing that out. Um, I think we're, we're at 40 to the hour now. So, Erja, do you? There we go. Yeah, thank you so much for that great conversation. And we've got some few interesting questions from the audience that have come in. I, I suppose since you were just talking about the feeling of being called that some of the characters experience, um, Isha's question is, how does one engage with the work of Simone Way when mysticism has now become a cultural taboo, especially in university circles? And I was wondering if uh, you had thoughts about that. If you, you start off on this, you're an expert in Simone Way's work. <laughs> no, no, I, I do want to give most of the, t the time over to, uh, over to you. But I, I'll just say a couple of things. Mysticism is now culturally taboo, but there is a return to it. There is a return to it, and I and I, and I know this because uh, two years ago I started the UK Simone Weil Research Network, uh, and we had the a big conference on Weil about two or three weeks ago, and it sold out. And then after it sold out, I got people writing to me, "Can I come? Can I come?" I said, "We don't have any space. I'm really sorry." Uh, and there were people wanting to tune in from across the world, and we've got what have we got? 80, 70, 70 odd people here. There's a return to it. And I think that's, that's partly because what Lars and I was discussing earlier, this idea of contradiction is allowing for mystery in the world. It's allowing for there to be something that is not worked through, that's not understood and being okay with that, being there in, in the world. That's what mystery is in a way. Contradiction remains mysterious. Reason makes things transparent to the mind. As soon as I've done the kind of multiplication, as soon as I've done whatever it is, four plus four equals eight, gone that goes but if i come up against some sort of contradiction it stays with you and so it's something that people are desperate not to have those things which they can kind of think about resolve and then move on and progress forwards they're very much i think after now a thinker who allows them to attend in a different kind of way to sit with a set of ideas and i think that's what's happening when people are now slightly coming back to, okay, okay mm, maybe maybe mystery, mysticism is an interesting uh, methodology, as it were. Maybe we will introduce mystery back into our way of thinking about the world, and it might make us more kind of attentive. I mean, I don't know what Lars wants mm. to say about that. That's, be that's be beautifully put, and I, I think I, I would certainly agree with that. The idea of mystery, uh, a certain opacity, that which resists um, reason, that which resists uh, being revealed, something hidden, and that thing being hidden in it's something which is quite mundane, something quite ordinary, the relation to other people who are suffering. Mm -hmm. This is not some exalted experience, this, this, this experience of, of what really matters, what matters most. It's there, it's all around us. Now, in the novel, um, 
my character Simone Vey, she found she's part of a charity which is a direct action charity where you try to immediately resolve the um the situations of the homeless you, you go out you go out there and you give them money you give them food I, I know people involved in such charities um it's regarded as naive as foolish that naivety and foolishness is something which um again it has a place in a world which is technologically determined uh, this sort of impulse to do something immediately to help to act then and there these are not um, unimportant things. So this idea of opacity, something which resists reason, right there around us on the streets, I think this is this is extremely important to attend to. Mm, absolutely, and 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 just finally as well, you know, Vey Vey was very interested in making those small gestures that you just spoke about, Lars, the ones that seem kind of inconsequential to the bigger picture. She nevertheless would do it, and you know, the most the most obvious one to to give to the audience now is when Vey was kind of exiled in, 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 in the UK at the end of her life, refusing to eat any more than her, uh, any more rations than her occupied comrades in France. It's a completely, it's a gesture which has no effect on the lives of the people, but it's a, it's a small kind of naive gesture which takes on uh, a significance, which is, well, a, you know, a religious significance as well, those, those small gestures. So yeah, thank you. Thanks for that. Um... We have another question um, from Isha, which says, you mentioned a few times that Simone Ray talks about attention. Could you talk more about what she has to say about attention and how some of these ideas might be relevant today in our age of technology, which Lars, you were just briefly mentioning. Sure, so the question is, how do we attend that which matters? There's an ancient tradition of an ancient um, philosopher called Plotinus, and Plotinus argues that philosophy is about what matters most. The idea for Simone Weil is what matters are most is all around us. If we can only attend to it properly, attending is a is, is involves a certain attitude, a patience, a waiting, allowing that thing to be itself, um, and you know, above all for for Simone Weil, it's um, trying to remove oneself from the relationship to the thing. It's not about what one wants. It's not about what one demands. It's not about your projects. In fact, Simone Weil writes really movingly of the relationship to other people, other suffering people. She says, in that relationship, um, she feels that she's getting in the way of God because God is acting through her in witnessing these suffering others and helping the suffering others. God is acting through her and the other is receiving God's help. And she feels that she, Simone Weil, as the vehicle of charity, um, is someone who should be nobody, put out of the equation, decreated, not even there. So God can break into reality through her actions, and then deliver charity um, to those who need charity. Yeah. I, I think the question is really, really interesting. Um, you know, how does they understand attention in the in the age of technology? Uh, a lot of people are writing at the minute in kind of political theory and so on and so forth about the attention economy, the way in which what is what what, what is what, what makes money these days is keeping our attention on something. Um, but they doesn't mean the kind of attention that I pay to my phone when she's talking about attention. In fact, that's precisely what she doesn't mean. That's the kind of muscular attention, uh, the kind of materialistic understanding of, of attention whereby my phone is pinging all the time. There's certain uh, endorphins or whatever that it's releasing into my body when I'm seeing all the likes on my social media and I'm, and I'm physically attached to it. And I'm kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm enslaved to it. Um, what they wants is is the opposite of that. She wants us to to attend in a different way, which is a uh, an evacuating of ourselves really in the face of the other. And Lars spoke about this really eloquently. Um, and it means it's an it's an ethical prescription for they attending. Once we learn how to attend, we learn how to minimize ourselves in the face of the other. And this is the beginning of ethical action for they. Um, and it's a kind of um, it's a kind of replication of god's own attention and 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 what i what i mean by that and this is to draw up another uh, concept that lars talks about in in the book they has a very strange creation theology where god kind of evacuates himself in order for the other to come in order for creation to come forward and they thinks because this is the highest good that's what we need to do and no, in order to um, attend to the other in order to kind of evacuate ourselves we must enter into this kind of practice of attention for Vey. So it has huge ethical implications for Vey. Um, and in and, and in the techno technological society that we live in, 
It's about taking our attention back from those people who have colonized it and giving it to the other by kind of releasing ourselves or kind of evacuating ourselves. Um, and I think there's a lot of people who, who are doing work at the minute on very inattention and technology. So yeah, have a Google on that. And I think you'll find some, some really interesting stuff. Thanks for that. Um, okay, so a separate, on a separate note, we have a question from Denson Staples who asks about how the dynamic laid out in Ray's work of contradiction relates to other philosophical methods that may seem similar. So what he has in mind is dialectical movement between thesis, antithesis, and synthesis, or perhaps given the nature of the trilogy to compare the methods of Wittgenstein or Nietzsche um, so I think the question is, how do these different methods relate to each other? Mm, that's a very tough question, but um, I'll, try, I'll try and respond. It's interesting in, in the work of Nietzsche and um, Simone Weil is the emphasis on harmony. In both thinkers, harmony is important. And bringing together that which is ostensibly dissonant. So in Nietzsche's work, the, the, the idea of, um, of harmony is really, really, really crucial. As we, as it's one of these great unexpected moments where it suddenly occurred to me the other day that both um, Nietzsche and Simone Weil are thinkers of harmony, ways in which we can resolve dualism. Now, of course, Hegel is doing exactly something, something very similar. How can we, how can we overcome apparently con contrary uh, positions by overcoming them dialectically, by moving uh, such that thesis and antithesis, one position and the counterposition, are brought together into a new whole? Well, for Simone Weil and for Nietzsche in, in some ways, it would take, take longer to actually um, argue this through, but anyway. Trust me, um, harmony is a way of preserving contraries as contraries, but also seeing the way in which they hold together. Mm -hmm. So you're not sublating them, you're not, you're, not, you're not bringing them to a new level, you're not solving them in that sense, you're seeing the way in which they hold together supernaturally um, in, this, in this harmony. So that's the way in which Simone Weil says we can understand the universe as, a, as, the, as the cross, the cross on which um, Jesus is crucified. The whole universe is the cross. Um, at one and the same time, um, it's a world of terrible evil, and that yet this world is a world of proportion and harmony and measure. So I think that, that that's that's a way of trying to sketch an answer, at least. Mm, absolutely, I, I really I, I, everything that Lars said, plus one or one or two things more that I'd, I'd maybe add. The cross is is phase. Uh, his is her go-to when she's trying to talk about contradiction because what we see on the cross is that you know absolute good and absolute horror somehow held together in one moment um i suppose with a kind of dialectical philosophy of, of the hegelian kind we're moving towards something um whereas for ve i think that the coming up against contradiction is about a stillness it's about a stopping from moving for a moment if reason is the thing which is progressing us technologically and they is going to talk about this in her critique of capitalism and her critique of bureaucracy and in her critique of speed and the constantly moving forward of the machine and the factory and so forth to a kind of end goal attention and contradiction is a precisely a, a slowing down a kind of a stopping of that and a silence as well so if if in kind of hegelian dialectics we're kind of getting somewhere um for they we're almost stopping uh, and that's what contradiction is doing it's it's kind of it's it's stopping you and when you stop you can begin to attend um you can't attend if you're moving forward because you're constantly moving towards um something which your thoughts projected into the future so it, it is it's about that stopping that stepping back and uh, and 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 it's very difficult i don't want to say a rejection of progression but a rejection of kind of technological and rational progression i'd say uh, in order to kind of get to that more attentive and maybe spiritual even, if you want to use that term, place. The next question is from Alice Tamimi, who asks, um, he, she, I mean, she says, Lars, your books are very funny, but Vail seems on the face of it to be somebody who is very serious. Um, does she have a sense of humor that informs some of her writings? Mm, that's a very interesting question, actually. Yeah, that's. I mean, I don't know the text well enough to. to, to is, is there humour there, Tiff? I, I don't know in, in Simone Weil's work. Well, it's an interesting question because we, I, I put on uh, Philip Wilson, who translated Weil's play and her, and her poems, and the idea of Weil is the arch aesthetic, the kind of 
the 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 the, the giving up of every pleasure of the body and so on. He says, no, no, that's nonsense. If you read the diaries, you read the book, she's always going out to the theater. She's eating nice food. She's doing all these things. So she enjoys the pleasures of the body as well. Um, in the same way that the Simone in, in, in the book, she gets taken out for dinner and she always orders the cheapest thing, but she nevertheless goes along. You know, she nevertheless mm. goes along. Um, so I don't think she was completely deadly serious, but I think when it came to her writing, she was deadly serious. Um, and th there is a serious to her to her there, but I don't, don't think that means she's without humour. Um, that's a really interesting question, actually, the place of humour in Vey. I mean, I don't know if, if, if Lars, you can say any more than that, but I guess the reason we're both struggling is because it's not often spoken about. Mm, that's right, exactly. I mean, I suppose it'd be a question of rereading the biography by her close friend. It's an enormous biography. It's a great biography. And as you're saying that if, you know, Simone Vey went out, she had a good time. She went to a, um, a club with drag, drag artists, during the Spanish Civil War, wherever she was, um, that, that was very that was really interesting to me, and she really enjoyed going to this place. When she was she's living in London, she go to pubs, and she mm -hmm. enjoyed the life in, in in London pubs. So she was someone who's, who's very much part of the world. But I, I need to think more about your question, which I think is a very interesting one. Yeah, it's great. Thank you, Alice, for that. Really interesting. I suppose another sort of related question from Lynn is: Did Wei see art or writing as a form of prayer, or if she has anything to say about? prayer and relationship between art and prayer well i know tiff you've got a great answer on this about rhythm so I'm, 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 i want you to say that because that's yeah. yeah i mean certainly you know they they saw certain recitations of poems almost as a form of prayer famously she had her first mystical ex second mystical experience i think i got that wrong then second mystical ex mystical experience by reciting George Herbert's poem, Love, and she would certainly return to certain poems and certain things as a form of meditation or prayer. It might also be kind of Gregorian chant or music. So for Vey, there was, there was a close similarity between certain forms of art and prayer. And Vey, uh, and Vey has a very uh, high bar of what counts as, as good writing and, and good art. Um, so she cer certainly wouldn't have thought everything um, would have would have got you there but she but she certainly thought that certain authors um held truth in the same way maybe as the gospels do and certain prayers do so she she would elevate the literary and maybe art i suppose certain paintings the medieval period particularly um to that very very high realm where it could almost become a form of prayer certainly uh, and and lars's book is you know again the important thing of the way that lars was 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 reading it in this in this very almost like a verse like way, I thought reminded me of the of the of the way in which they spoke about chanting and and literature and prayer and these sorts of things. Yes, yeah, in the rhythm, isn't it? Well, yeah. There's a, a, Simone Bay says somewhere that um, the art that she feels is truly significant is that which can echo the opening of Psalm 22, which is um, "My Lord, My Lord, why have you why, why have you forsaken me?" Remember, that's what Jesus says on the cross, you know, just before he says it's finished. He feels forsaken in that moment. Um, and that's what great art is supposed to do for Simone Weil. It's supposed to ring out with the idea of help, help me, help us. You know, we long for something beyond this world. We, we want something beyond um, the world we see around us. What is it? Can you tell me? Can you help me? So that's the idea of the artwork itself as calling out, as imploring for something. That sense of yearning is something which I deliberately try to put into the novel. All over and over again, this idea of yearning, of wanting, of desiring, a sense of being utterly forsaken, of feeling a dereliction. And that's particularly the case with Johnny. Johnny's the character who feels this most acutely, that he feels that he's been lost and left behind. But of course, in, in, when, when Jesus quotes Psalm 22 on the cross, what's very interesting there is, presumably he would he would he would know that his readers would, would would be familiar with the rest of the psalm which is a long psalm one of the really long really one of the really really big psalms and as the psalm goes on an answer comes there's a sense in which um okay you you, you you might feel forsaken but nevertheless you have faith there is something which which can come so there's a contradiction there between that feeling of dereliction and also the certainty of faith in some way so that is what i wanted to capture in um, my vey, the novel, and especially as it comes towards the end, that okay, there's dereliction, there's something else as well.